Hello, my name is Chris. I'm a KMP developer. Uh, today we're going to be uh, going um, through a little a little mini course. Uh, it's not a full deep dive. It's unlike any course I've ever actually taken, but it's the course I really wish I had, someone had given me in the beginning of uh, or near when I got interested in doing software development. And uh, the series is called How to Program from the Bottom Up. Oh, tech support is coming out. I said Tuesday uh, to close that portal. So I'm sure they'll they'll be out and doing that. So let's get this over here. Nope, that's the wrong one. Okay, here we are. So I am in the IDE right now. Uh, and if you want to learn how to open up the IDE, you can go down here to the instruction page and this is how to install the IDE, uh, which you can read the markdown documents and run code uh, from here. Um, it has a little instruction here. I know how to do that. Um, and we you can also just go to the website and I'm sure that's how you found found this and you can just go and read it online so I'm gonna do both at the same time uh, so here it is um, this is a guide for anybody that wants a solid understanding of software development as a historical walk through the essential parts of computing leading to the present day software development par paradigms like so a lot of stuff that we're using is a mix and blend of stuff that happened a long long time ago that honestly not <laughs> Uh, let me get into it. Uh, this is not a thorough deep dive into any one topic, but a broad overview of the core concepts and principles that are missing from most programming tutorials and courses. My goal is to give you the context about why things are the way they are in computing and how they became that way, and the issues and problems that arose from them you know, that come up from the structuring things in this particular fashion. Um, I have found that it's, more, it's far more important to uh, understand the process uh, that people went through to create the current solutions than understand the mechanical details of how the solutions work. So a lot of stuff that I've been presented in my long journey of learning how to do stuff from the age seven when I first uh, encountered a computer, um, computer software de uh, development, uh, to multiple different colleges from community college all the way up to university level, <laughs> different colleges. Different teachers, lots of different approaches, different jobs I've worked at. Um, I've been to a couple different uh, boot camps, and no one teaches this stuff. And it's really disappointing because a lot of times they're using they're just using the words, but they have a lot of these people just haven't gone down the same journey I've gone down with like getting involved with electronics when I was like six years old, five years old, six or seven. And um, yeah, these people teaching stuff just honestly confuse me quite a bit. I'm sure they've confused you. Um, I found so, okay, so there's uh, so a lot of this stuff is just people just didn't know how this stuff uh, works. So here's the link to the series that you're currently watching. Um, so introduction is this down here. Let's go down here for a little bit. Um, this is a guide for like budding software engineers that want uh, they need a primer overview of software development concepts for the fundamental physical logic representation to the high level. Uh, programming languages um and the so so that's kind of just reiterating what i just said uh and i, and I do just want to say out loud i would like to say at outset this is a tr there's a tremendous uh, number of really technical sounding words that um are really all oftentimes referring to some basic core idea that's just a variation on a theme of something else so i've encountered lots of people who in the computer field who are very have very strong feelings that they know exactly what and one thing is different than the other and you know i did i had to go down and see if it was right and it's just like no this is just that this is just that it's constantly that been like that it's like no this is just this other thing with a different twist on it and and it's the same stuff over and over okay so the essence of a computer so people used to do all this stuff that the computers do they all see they used to do it by hand in big rooms of people and use pneumatic tubes to like transfer information back and forth. And people would actually add up the columns by hand and using an abacus or uh, just memorizing the numbers and just adding them up. Uh, all been done by hand. Uh, the computer actually was a position, a named position uh, in a company or in an organization. The person that actually, it was usually women that would just add these numbers all day long. It was super boring work. And very error pr error prone, of course. Um, yeah, so the machine knows nothing about the problem. That's not what I want to make clear. It's, it's just following orders created by clever people, clever humans, to using Boolean logic, which is we'll get into it, uh, to represent the problem, the sequence of actions to solve it. 
Um, each operation of the computer is once done by teams of people working in groups. And, you know, all of it simula all this the computer stuff is just simulating all the stuff that they were already doing um, and just starting to uh, automate certain aspects of it. And that's that's really what we're what we're dealing with. Um, so each there are specialized rules for each person. Like for example, the storage in the computer. There's a set of filing cabinets and a clerk, somebody that's assigned or a series of clerks who are designed to go get the records and retrieve them and send them back. It's still, you can go to county clerk house, county courthouses, that's basically the same thing yeah. uh, as, a, as a computer filing cabinet. And, and, you know, behind the scenes, they're still implementing everything with computers. But at one point in time, it was just people with big filing cabinets. Um, can't get into that. Uh, let's see. So, yeah, there's no magic in computing um it's just human cleverness human systemic thinking and human ingenuity ingenuity to sit to solve these problems and i've just heard even people in like the computer field and business like really talking to like these machines are thinking or they know what's going on or anything like that it's like no a anytime that comes up it's super confusing to me because i do have you know all this sci-fi sci knowledge and also hardcore like what's really possible with current technology so i've got so it's like when somebody says oh it's just thinking it's like is it really thinking or is it just going through an algorithm that's making decisions based on input that's somewhere else okay so what is it it's not really thinking it's just running through and we'll get into it it's just running a little a little loop going hmm, is this it or is this it is this it is this it? oh this is it and then does something else that's all that's going on um, so a lot of times people are just being very lazy with their, with their wording, uh, how they, how they speak about this stuff, uh, or they're anything it's irrelevant. It may be like just a, a, a turn of phrase just to be shorthand. Uh, often it's does confuse things quite a bit, especially if you're just getting started. Uh, and usually they don't understand the problem or the solution enough to explain it. And they become very hand wavy. <laughs> well, like it just kind of does this thing over here. It's like, I don't know. I've just really noticed this thing that a lot of people, especially in the computer field, I don't know what it, what it is, or just humans in general, are very, um, they don't want to be shown up. Or they don't want to have any kind of uh, misunderstanding of their knowledge to be exposed at all, even like teachers. <sighs> Super annoying. Like, I'm just trying to get to the proof. I don't care if you know or don't know. I still like you as a person. It doesn't matter. It's okay to admit that you don't know or don't understand. It is okay, and that's how we get to the truth. But I just know so, so many people in this field. I get money's involved. Like people have all this ego about. Like I know how to program. It's like who can't know? It doesn't mean anything. So the machines can never understand the problem and, and the solution the way humans conceive the problem. These machines are only allowed, uh, are only following logical operations that humans have carefully designed to represent the problem and the solution space. That means like in this particular representation of the problem, we can do these things on this particular way and this board of, you know, if it's a game board, we can only make these moves and, you know, the, the game board isn't actually a real thing. I mean, it kind of is. It's just one thing, but it's representing something else, right? This game board is representing something. Oh, yeah, that's the whole thing really what's going on. So the only way the machine would ever know the full human context of the problem. This is why the AI is, is, is not really mis, is a misnomer. Like the AGI stuff will never happen. Um, and, and we'll just have this, you know, we'll have simu we'll have neural network stuff, you know, simulated SI stuff, but there are, just, there are limits to that stuff. You can only go so far with it. So the thing is like the only way the machine would ever know the full human context of the problem and the solution is the machine actually was human and then it would be a human okay if, it, if the machine was human it would be a human and then now it's not the machine anymore okay so mistaking the machine for having an intelligence called the eliza effect i do have a story about what i've done in the past which i'm not super proud of it but at the time i was just like is this really a thing i was kind of sort of doing experiments with the eliza effect and yes so people are just really love to anthropomorphize these machines and these techniques for some reason and there is a group of people who do encourage this, you know, running sales organizations. Okay, that, you know, I get it. All right, so let's go to the uh, essence of computing. What are we doing here? So how much time have we got? I got nine minutes, 10 minutes in. Okay, I'm doing pretty good on time. Uh, the essential question in computing, what are we representing with this digital information? And there's been a lot of ways people have... Um, represented things in the past <laughs> to hold information and to convey meaning of what information means. So we got beads on a string. 
This is number 14. This is uh, this is uh, number 251, 251. There's the key over here. And the key is the, is the representation. This means this. This means this. This means this. When you see that, it means that. When you see this, it means that. It's, we, we're doing symbols. These are symbols. They don't actually, this, these beads don't actually, they're a, a, a raw abstract idea of a number of what? I don't know. Bush has the corn. Somebody made a deal with an Uncle Jim down the street for last year. And this is how we keep track of what he said he was going to give us and how many he, he's got. And yeah, that's how it works. That's the CRUD operations. <laughs> Create, read, update, delete. <laughs> this is standard computer stuff that happens all day long, like web stuff. So, okay, physical indentations in clay. You know, that's this is four four bushels. This is worth four bushels of corn. So if you give this to Farmer Jim, he'll give you four bushels, and this guy can then give it for, you know three bushels of wheat. Or you give me two of these, and you get five goats or something. You know what? It's all representation. It's like it's, it doesn't really mean anything, right? There's the, these 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 things aren't actual corn. They represent corn, right? These things don't actually represent money. I mean, they just represent. I could trade this with some guy down the street. Who are all playing the same game of that represents this, this represents that. As <laughs> humans love this shit. Beads on an abacus, yeah. That was used up till to today. People still in other countries, no electricity, no batteries. And they are super fast. Super fast. You can get really fast at this and do really fast calculations. And here's the, the hand. The handwritten is Mr. Here's the, here's the for this day. These are the transactions that happened to these people. And this is how much money went in or out. <laughs> With the red and the the red and the black ink, so there was no mistaking which way it was going. <laughs> All right. So and also we got the positions of sticks, scenes at a distance. Let's see what this is about. So I'm only going to do previews of this of this stuff. Uh, these videos. So, so we have a bunch of ways of doing communication, right? I'm going to this is talking about the thing. So this has had these semaphores. You would look at a distance, and it people would have different signals set up for uh, how they how they how, what this meant. And then when the telescope would happen, they go like, "Holy shit, we can go a long way with this. We can go super far with this stuff." And right here, here's the, here's the symbols. Like they had these towers and these operators, and they would they were this thing back and forth. And look with their spyglass, like oh, they're doing this and that. <laughs> Get the symbols. I'm gonna do a little like a subscribe. This guy needs it. Needs our help. Yeah. So this this was used for a long time. This tower would see that tower, that tower. They they, they had a whole sequence of things. <laughs> Set everything up. It's amazing. Like human beings are really clever. Okay, punch holes in paper card. This is another one. 1800s and 1970s. To the 1970s, this is what it was like the first use of binary, like coded, like electrically controlled stuff. This is called the Herman Hall Herman Hollerith uh, census machine, this thing. So every time the electrical current went through this thing, every time you tamped it down, there's a card went in here. You tamped down that lever, it would it register a, a vote or whatever is in this slot. Let's take a look here. Let's go ahead and take a look and see what this is all about. So here's the, here's the here's the machine, and there it is. It's how you make you punch the holes in the card, and then this thing would da would would dab down right there. This little thing would dab down in those holes, and this was a merc. It had liquid mercury. You know? <laughs> real toxic stuff. So to I mean, they just had to stop because people it was too toxic uh, to even touch it. And there's there here's the battery. That would, you know, every time you tump it down, it would turn the dial in one, little, years and eight one, one little slot. We're a little further. This is like really early, early, super early co computing. Very clever arrangement of uh, motors and dials and little. <laughs> it's just really, I mean, this saved so much time. This actually made it possible to have the census run uh, for the growing country, you know, because it was taking like more of the years. It was taking more than 10 years to count it. <laughs> and at the pace they were good, the country was growing, it was going to take like 50 years if they, if they didn't have something like this. So, uh, And here's like, this is how they used it up until just recently. I mean, when I was a kid, they were still making this stuff. This, uh, I show a lot of these old movies, these old videos, because these old, they were took, they actually showed you more in detail how these things operate. And there's all the cards and they're different colors and stuff. And they go to these machines and sh 
sort them around. You can watch the videos. I'm going to fast forward through all this stuff. You can go watch these videos in full. I hope you do. And then, you know, it has all the punch holes here. They have machines. And then the, each one of these lines along here, each one of these lines here represents a number. So you're going to punch out for one or two or three or four or five. And then that would be the numbers for, like, then they have the letters here, A, B, C, D, F, G. They would have different, different digits here. And it would go into a machine, and each one of the characters would come through. It would be just like typing on a keyboard, except that it's very reproducible. It can run it through the machine. It has little contacts here that would... Made between two cards is, of zip, course, zip. ignored by the machine. Yeah, so there's how that works. So every time a little hole opens up, it would clear a switch, and that would... <laughs> that would work. Um, they also could do, like, these crazy... These tubes. It was basically a TV tube. Old-timey TV tube. And this is how they were doing uh, old... Uh, this is how they did RAM back in the day, random access memory. This is how they would actually store the bits. <laughs> the same bits here. Uh, oops. Uh, not that, ding dong. The same bits here. The same lines in here. The same bits here. <laughs> the same scratches. is the same holes. This And those holes are then these little dots that are held on a tube. But it keeps refreshing because the phosphor stays lit for a little while. It can go in a little cycle where it refits oh there's a display of well here's how you do a line you know this is like the early drawing of <laughs> this early output this is where we came up with a video display this is like directly came from this the manchester this is the birth of america let's go take a look at the, what this is so america. so here's the interview of this thing this guy the inventor of this thing this is how they did the early computers this is how it's signals on the this is how it was like show up on the screen like this on the phosphor and uh this is how they kept the memory of the computer <laughs> they could also do the first like just character displays this is like the this is like the origin of it it was like in the 40s here's some more stuff with the you know, oh, crt store and it was just made out of a bunch of tubes we'll get into that a little bit show you some of how that stuff works in the next episode because that's pretty fun to know how that stuff works it's like what are you guys doing and here's these core memories these are the little little pieces of iron little iron sticks and they would run these wires through it and there you know we'll go into like how megas behave a little bit but um yeah so here's a magnetic view you can actually on the tape use this little thing that condenses magnetic filings so you can see where the where it's positively and negatively polarized and it stays like that and you can use this viewer there's no there's no power on this thing it just changes this little liquid into a magnetic field and this is like so neat because i always wondered how big it was it's just this there's just like these little codes up and down so that's the signal uh that's just the same as the cuts in the clay except it's magnetic fields in this strip of iron iron coated thing <laughs> it's been magnetized and then that thing you could scale it up coat that same thing on a disc and spin it and use a little arm going back and forth to pick up the magnetic fields just like the same way in this this little viewer is you can actually pick up electrically um signals that will you know pick up that shows that where the field is and then you could like get rid of all the spinning shit all together <laughs> And then put in little chips, tiny little, little, tiny little chips. It's little pieces of charge inside there that represents the same thing that, that was being represented here. Same thing. Things like ones and zeros, ones and zeros, ones and zeros. All in little cells, all tiny little cells in these things. There's like a million of them in here. <laughs> 500 million of them. We'll get into how that's all, all done. And the whole thing, idea is if you can create any machine... Using Boolean logic, they have water ones, they have relay ones, they have all kinds of computers that are based on Boolean logic. But as soon as you have Boolean logic, which means you can do, we'll get into it, these and or non operations, any machine that can do that can do it's like, it's not how fast it does it, but any machine can do it, can do all the things we have on these modern machines could be, have been done back in the 40s. It would have taken a month to do one frame. <laughs> But uh, they, you know, all this stuff was still there, so it could have, it could have actually happened back then. Um, so they're like and or not gates, and then you can use these state machines. You can click on that and find out what that's about, um, uh, which is just a way of thinking about problems. It's just a way of boolean logic. If it's this, is, if it does this, it's take you know keep looping here until something happens, and do this other thing until keep looping there that something happens, and then come back to this same thing or go to something else. That's the state machines. Not super difficult to understand. Um, 
Our logical operators are built up uh, using patterns called algorithms. So these are just strategies of doing things. And they're grouped together. Those, all those algorithms are grouped together in a program. It could be a simple, tiny little one. And that's an algorithm or the whole damn thing. Um, and the whole computer system could be considered algorithmic because it's you know, just running all kinds of crazy stuff inside there. All kinds of different ideas of technology. It's like based on human ingenuity and cleverness to exploit certain properties of naturally. This is just naturally occurring phenomenon. Nobody's creating anything. We're just exploiting the way nature works, especially like these magnets and phosphor delays and capacitance. How charges get built up and they stay and they don't, they decay over time, but they can stay there. Exploiting all that stuff. It's like fundamental things of nature. Um, and we're using it just to do something useful for us. The machine has no idea. It doesn't even care. Like, it has no idea what's going on. So we do all this stuff. Like somebody's like, hey man, these dots appear. Well, what happens if we could have some way to detect if the if the photons are still there? And then we can use that to feed back to see, like, use, like, keep a, like a memory system going. It's like, well, I'll be damned if we can't not do that. We can totally... We can totally do that. And then somebody does it. They're like, they use it for a while. And then something better comes along. Like these magnetic cores are like way more efficient. They just way faster. And then you get the, oh, we'll do the tape. And then we do the, the platter. And that's super fast. And so it's like, okay, well, this is super, even faster. All right. That's really what's going on. So um, that's got to be it for this episode. I'm going to continue on to uh, hardware. That's the next thing we'll talk about.